There is nothing like this sound of finely crafted musical instruments played by excellent musicians. And you must hear them perform live and in person to really appreciate the experience. While recordings can be quite beautiful, even the best are mere reflections. I'll never forget the first time I ever heard a harp played in person. It was heavenly. All fine instruments, no matter what they are, must be experienced live to hear the true sound that so easily touches the heart in the hands of excellent musicians. It's for this reason that we honor those who build the finest musical instruments and musicians will always seek out their creations. Perhaps the most famous and greatest musical instrument maker of all time is Antonio Stradivari. Though he died in 1737, the 650 surviving instruments of the approximately 1,200 violins, cellos, guitars, and harps he built are the most cherished and most expensive of all time. In fact, every instrument he made has its own name, so you'll hear of the Molitor violin, the Duport cello, and the Sabionati guitar. Not long ago, his violin, named the Lady Blunt, sold for $15.9 million. Stradivari was a luthier, a maker of stringed instruments. He learned his craft from Nicola Amati in his hometown of Cremona, Italy. Even though stringed instruments played with bows date back to antiquity, it was in the year 1560 that Amati's grandfather, Andrea, designed and created the violin as we now know it. Amati violins are also prized instruments and are extremely expensive, but none have reached the fame of the Stradivarius. By the way, Stradivarius is the Latin name for Stradivari. Stradivari violins are known for their wonderful sound and ability to project that sound a relatively great distance. Some attribute these qualities to the reddish finish Stradivari applied to his instruments, while others believe it was the particular wood he used. Scientists have gone so far as to study the historic climate conditions affecting the growth rings in the trees he used. Numerous times, his instruments have been studied with all kinds of modern scientific devices to unlock the secret of their beauty, all to no avail. There have also been many blind sound tests where participants try to identify the Stradivarius from a number of other instruments being played. This has led to the belief by some that these instruments are overrated, but they have not had a significant effect on the demand for, or the cost of, instruments made by Stradivari. The demand for his instruments skyrocketed after his death in 1737, and Stradivarius fever spread rapidly. Many local players could no longer afford his instruments because they were purchased by museums and private collectors as investments. Due to their great value, Strad violins have been stolen many times throughout history, and even today many Strad violins are missing from their rightful owners. Not long ago, the FBI was called in to assist with the retrieval of the famed Lipinski Stradivarius. Coming out of the back door of a concert hall, violinist Frank Alman was shot with a taser and the thief grabbed the Lipinski and fled to a waiting vehicle. Agents were able in a few days to trace the taser from the manufacturer to the purchaser, a Milwaukee barber named Universal Knowledge Allah. At the same time, with the investigation in high gear and a $100,000 reward available, police received a tip regarding Milwaukee resident Salah Salahayton. A week after the robbery, Allah and Salah Hayden were arrested and charged. The Lipinski was found in a crawl space of a house, wrapped in a baby blanket and an old suitcase. Another famous robbery of a Strad is the case of the Gibson X Huberman violin. It was stolen from the dressing room at Carnegie Hall in 1936 by a fan who had snuck into the rear of the auditorium during a concert and went missing for 50 years until a man revealed on his deathbed that he had purchased it from a thief from a hundred dollars and then played it himself after disguising it by covering its original finish with black shoe polish. It took nine months to restore it and eventually it was purchased by famed violinist Joshua Bell for just under four million dollars. 
Joshua Bell still performs and records with that instrument today, and he used it to perform on the soundtrack for the film, The Red Violin. This movie traces the history of a Stradivari-like instrument through the ages. There have been other movies, books, and YouTube videos about Stradivari and his violins and other instruments. Finally, it's important to note that the city of Cremona was the center for many great violin makers. Stradivari and his sons Francesco and Omobono built violins there, as did generations of the Amati family luthiers. The Guarneri family also produced many valuable instruments through generations of builders. It's amazing that so much talent and creativity has been centered in this one town in northern Italy. The piano. It's the most versatile and complete instrument ever invented. Piano music can be the most complex and most difficult to perform. Unlike many other instruments that can only play one note at a time, a skilled pianist can play ten or more notes with one movement of the hands. Let's take the clarinet as an example. It requires two hands and often several fingers to play just a single note. For the piano, one finger alone creates one note. So, by using two hands, many notes can be played at a time. In addition, several different musical lines can be played on a piano at once by skillful manipulation of the fingers. And we can hear a bass line, a chord line, and a melody line at the same time. It's literally a miniature orchestra. The piano, derived from the harpsichord, which was most likely invented in the Middle Ages, and there are great differences in the two instruments. The harpsichord literally plucks each string when a key is depressed, similar to the plucking of a lute or guitar string with a pick. The piano, on the other hand, uses small hammers to strike each string when a key is depressed. This fundamental difference allows for a greater variation in the softness or loudness of the notes being played. That's why the original name for the piano was the forte piano which means loud and soft in Italian. Over the centuries, the name was shortened to simply piano. The harpsichord was prevalent throughout Europe during the Middle Ages and early Renaissance, and an Italian musical instrument maker named Bartolomeo Cristofori transformed it into the forte piano around 1700. Cristofori was a Paduan craftsman specializing in the care and creation of harpsichords, and he was quite skilled at that trade. It is believed that the Prince of Tuscany, named Ferdinand, met him at one of the famous Carnavale celebrations held in Venice each year. The wealthy prince loved music and owned many musical instruments, and the person in charge of their care had recently died. He offered the position to Cristofori, who at first refused. Ferdinand increased his offer substantially based on Cristofori's excellent reputation. And Cristofori was convinced to travel to Florence. There he was expected to care for all the instruments and also build new ones for the prince's pleasure. Cristofori built many instruments for the prince before creating the fortepiano, among them a spinatone, a highly original oval spinet, and a clavicitharium, or upright harpsichord. By 1698, he began working on the forte piano, and by 1711, he had finished three of them. The new instrument was slow to be accepted because it was quite expensive to make, but by the 1760s, a more affordable version had been developed, which increased its popularity. Cristofori was highly regarded for his skills and genius in his own time, and even now he is credited for his originality. Early instrument scholar Grant O'Brien has written, The workmanship and inventiveness displayed by the instruments of Cristofori are of the highest order, and his genius has probably never been surpassed by any other keyboard maker of the historical period. I place Cristofori shoulder to shoulder with Antonio Stradivari.
percussion instruments are among the most ancient of all musical instruments and they're still popular all over the world. One of the most fundamental and most frequently used is the tambourine. Tambourines are present in almost all folk and popular music of the world's cultures. In Italy, it's called the tamborello. In Persia and Arabia, it's the daff or the reek. The Hebrews named it the timbrel. The Irish have the bodron. Mozart, Stravinsky, Berlioz, and Tchaikovsky are classical composers who have written parts for the tambourine in their compositions, even though it's most used in folk and popular genres of music. Sometimes it's the only instrument played by dancers while they dance, or by singers as an accompaniment. The sound of the tambourine is associated with joy, dancing, rejoicing, victory, and times of happiness and gladness. The tambourine has a long history, and images of tambourines have been found on ancient Greek pottery and in Roman mosaics. In the Bible, Miriam plays a tambourine to celebrate the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. It is believed by some that the Crusaders brought the instrument to Europe from the Middle East. Tambourines come in all shapes and sizes, from circular ones to crescent-shaped ones, to triangular and square-shaped instruments. Typically, a tambourine is a circular wood frame covered on one side by a skin, and the wood frame has small circular symbols called zills spaced evenly in openings made throughout the frame. Tambourines can be played either by being held in the hand and hitting or tapping them. They can be mounted on a stand like cymbals in a drum set. They can be shaken or struck against the hip or beaten with sticks or hands as a drum when it's held in the lap of a player. In Italy, tambourine playing has been elevated to an art, with many different styles of performing dependent on the regional differences. Let's watch an Italian tambourine player perform a tambourine part for the Pizzica Tarantella, an extremely fast and ancient style of dancing. As you have seen, tambourine playing can be very intricate, but the tambourine can also be the simplest of instruments to play. That is probably the reason for its popularity the world over, and why it occupies an important place in Italian music. Although the mandolin is an ancient instrument, that has appeared in many cultures around the world. It is most closely associated with the music of Italy. Italian mandolin music is considered some of the most romantic and exciting music for the instrument. It is still very popular in Italy today. The modern Neapolitan mandolin was created in 1835 by Pasquale Vinacci. He came from a family of musical instrument makers and was the son of Gaetano Vinacci. Margarita, Queen of the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, which at the time included Sicily and the Neapolitan Kingdom, appointed him the Royal Musical Instrument Maker. Ancient mandolins were strung with catgut strings, which are very soft and do not produce a loud sound. Music historians believe it was the Venaccia family who first adapted the mandolin for high-tension metal strings. Structural changes had to be made to the body of the mandolin to accommodate this higher tension. It had to be made much stronger. Bonaccia achieved this and redesigned the instrument in many other significant ways. First, 
He deepened the bowl-shaped back of the instrument for greater resonance. This produced a richer and louder tone. Second, he split the top of the instrument, called the soundboard, into two different planes, with the second plane falling away from where the bridge was connected. He also added more frets for a total of 17. Finally, he utilized machine tuning heads instead of the traditional violin style pegs. Bonaccia created beautiful ornamentation and scroll work for his mandolins, making each a work of art that could be appreciated for its looks as well as its sound. Bonaccia's design has become known as the Neapolitan mandolin and its popularity endures. Let's enjoy some mandolin music. The mandolin I'm holding is one of Inacha's designs. It was not built by him. It was made in America in the year 1904. But I wanted to show you the true Neapolitan style mandolin. First of all, we have the bowl back. You can see the bowl back, right? This one is not uh, very ornately done as most of Inacha's were. And uh, we can also see here the break in the plane on the soundboard. And of course we have the 17 frets that are easily, easily seen right here. And finally we have the machine tuning keys, or tuning heads as they're called, instead of the pegs. And this mandolin, as I said, was made in 1904 in the United States by a company called Lion & Healy. The mandolin was extremely popular around the turn of the century. And the Lion and Healy uh, company produced many of them. It's a little difficult to play. It is over 100 years old, and the, the, the round back kind of is difficult for me to hold with my round belly. But it is a beautiful instrument. <laughs> If you're a guitarist, you've probably heard the name D'Angelico. D'Angelico guitars, made prior to 1964, fetched thousands of dollars on the open market and are owned by some of the greatest guitarists in the world. You'll also find D'Angelico guitars in museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. D'Angelico made all his instruments completely by hand in the old school tradition. When he was alive, 
He and his apprentices could make only 10 to 30 instruments a year, and clients would willingly wait 10 years or more to have one built for them by the master. Despite the demand for his instruments, he would often charge only what his customer could afford to pay or would give a guitar away to a person who truly appreciated it. At first, the Angelico made guitars using standard violin bracing, but he developed his own techniques as time went on. The Angelico built archtop guitars, and he carved the arch into the tops and bottoms of his guitars with his hands. Archtop guitars are similar to violins, which also have arch tops and bottoms. His instruments are known for their high quality, and they can be appreciated both for their sound and for their looks. Many of his guitars are acoustic, meaning they are not designed to be electrically amplified. He made guitars that were extremely powerful and were intended to be played with a 1930s or 40s style big jazz band. As time went on and musical styles changed, he did eventually add electric pickups to his creations. His New Yorker and XL models are the most prized. The distinctive headstock and the fine finish were visual hallmarks of the D'Angelico guitar. And of course, its beautiful sound was beyond compare. Let's listen to the mellow jazz tones of the D'Angelico guitar. John D'Angelico was born in Little Italy on Manhattan's Lower East Side in 1905 to immigrant parents from Naples. His father was a tailor and the family lived on Mott Street. When he was nine, he became an apprentice to Ralph Ciani, who was his great uncle. Ciani was a luthier, a maker of stringed instruments. He also may have studied violin making with the Italian immigrant luthier Mario Frosali. When Chiani died in 1923, D'Angelico took over the busy and prosperous shop, but he did not like having to be responsible for so many employees. In 1932, he opened his own small shop where he could happily work by himself with one or two others. As his fame grew, D'Angelico's recognition as the finest builder of archtop guitars brought offers from large companies, but ultimately he decided to keep his operation under his own name. He preferred a simple life and was not interested in making a great fortune and was satisfied as he was. He is quoted as saying, Big money? Big title? For what? I want to build guitars under my own name for my own customers the way I do it. For me, that's the good life. D'Angelico died in 1964. A major exhibition at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2011 called Guitar Heroes, Legendary Craftsmen from Italy to New York, featured John D'Angelico as well as three other famed Italian-American luthiers. This renewed tremendous interest in D'Angelico guitars. I'm Joanne Thomas Grove and I am a trustee here at the Solara Lodge. My name might not sound Italian, but my upbringing is. My mom, her maiden name, last name is Tamburello. Her family proudly came from Sicily. And we keep a lot of Italian customs in our household, especially at Christmas time. We make our own mozzarella, we make our own sausage. Um, we celebrate with the seven fishes on Christmas Eve. Um, it's a very large get-together, and it's, we're very lucky to have all our brothers and sisters still at, live on Long Island. My parents get to spoil their grandchildren all the time. We have a lot, a lot of get-togethers for um, 
family celebrations. And it's very important, our Italian heritage. And we parted that information with my kids and um, the grandkids. And we hope to keep that uh, in the future because heritage is very important. And if you do not give it to your children, it will be lost over time. And the great thing about the Solara Lodge is that we are Italian and we are also proudly American. Hi, my name is Raf Pace. I come from Oshaka, Sicily. I've been over here uh, from 1969, and uh, I to keep the heritage, the Italian heritage alive. I do sing an Italian anthem. I have it every, every occasion I have, and uh, especially when I, I'm part of the club that belong to the Sons of Italy. You know, they we enjoy singing the Italian songs. And uh, of course, the, American, the Italian anthem come first before everything else. I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be part of the Sons of Italy, and uh, I uh, enjoy very much, you know, the time I spend with my uh, my Italian heritage uh, friends. My name is Leslie Kennedy, and to honor my Italian heritage and traditions, my family on Thanksgiving has turkey and lasagna. I am also called upon by my children on any occasion to please bring some pastries. Thank you. My name is Sam Wattorino. I have the pleasure of making wine exactly the way my grandfather did so many, many years ago with grapes and love. No added sulfites, no added sugars, just all natural. In addition to that, I also make lemon cello the same way. Alcohol, lemons, low sugar, the way Grandpa made it. I love baby Hi, I'm Joanna. Um, my parents are both from Italy. My mother is Bares from Molfetta. My father is from a little town outside of Rome, Setti Frat. So our very special tradition is to make something for my mother's town called Carta Dai. It's a special pastry. You make it with a sauce and wine and almonds, and it's delicious. And when we make it, the house smells like Christmas. Buon Natale. My name is Anthony Inzarello, and one way that I honor my Italian heritage is I love to eat. And I hope one day to really honor my Italian heritage by buying a Lamborghini or a Ferrari. Hi, my name is Rose Izzo and I honor the Italian heritage by making some costumes that represent the 20 regions of Italy. I was honored to make a costume for one of the regions, and I hope you like it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diana Bracket De Stefano, and what I do to keep my Italian heritage alive, I make artichokes with breadcrumbs, the old-fashioned way that my mother used to make. Thank you. Hello, my name is Geraldine Ionello Graham. To keep Italian traditions alive, I am very, very careful about how we present our foods, in particular those of my Sicilian grandmothers, of bringing them down to my children and my grandchildren. For example, Christmas time, we love cucidade. We also love caponade, arancini, cardone, all the wonderful Sicilian delicacies. And that's one of my, my ways of keeping my traditions alive.